All right, we're going to talk about airway management. Airway management is a gigantic, really important skill in what we do in emergency medicine. Uh, my background is training in both internal medicine and emergency medicine. And when I did my internal medicine training at the end of three years, I was very good at thinking and not very good at doing things. And when I started EM training, one of the things that became crystal clear to me I was not good at was airway management. And that was back in the days when in the residency, we actually had no faculty from Friday night at five to Monday morning at eight, and they weren't there on holidays. So the reality was there were first, second, and third year residents running that emergency department, and it became really clear to me I had to get very good at airway management. The, uh, and it made it sort of a passion because I, was, I figured if I have to know this and if it's such a life-saving skill or life-threatening skill, if you do it wrong, I needed to get good at it. So I kind of got myself very heavily inv invested in airway management. And the other thing that, about it that I learned along the way, which I think you know, is that you are the expert at airway management in the hospital. It's not anesthesia. Anesthesia is really good. They're very good at what they do, but they're very good at the controlled airway or the I have some time to set it up airway. You happen to walk in the door and somebody who weighs 600 pounds who's basically in, in near respiratory arrest is yours because you're there. So you need to be good at a broad range of skills. What I'm not going to cover in this half an hour together is, is um, all the nuances of airway management, but I'm going to focus on a few things that I think are very helpful to you, and we're going to start, though, before we actually get to putting something down the airway. I'm going to start with sort of the non-invasive range of things. One of the things to know, so our, our job, our keys to success when we deal with airways or people that are having respiratory difficulties are to recognize impending respiratory failure early. Because if you intervene early, then you have no problem. And if you do the things that you need to do early, you can actually often preclude needing to intubate or at least make it something that's more controlled and something that's a little less stressful. So our job is to recognize that and then know what options you have. You know when it comes to oxygen delivery, you have a range from nasal cannula oxygen, which delivers maybe up to maybe 30% FiO2, maybe, it's more like in the sort of high 20s, all the way to a simple mask, which is, or excuse me, a Venturi mask, we can actually tell exactly what, how much oxygen you're giving. A simple face mask, which if you have them in your ER, please go home and throw them away. There is really no role in emergency medicine for a simple face mask. A non-rebreather mask, which has the reservoir where there's oxygen in it so that what they're breathing in there is the oxygen that's in that little doodad at the bottom. And the reason it has those little flappy things on the sides is that it, well, those flappy things, when the patient breathes in, occlude anything from coming in from the atmosphere and what they get is from the bag. And when they breathe out, it can actually come out those little flappy things. So those flaps are important in a non-rebreather. If the non-rebreather doesn't work, you actually have one more step before you get into something that's a little more machine-oriented, and that is basically doing assisted ventilation with a bag valve mask. You can actually bag valve mask somebody. So, so the FiO2 that you can deliver with a non-rebreather mask is maybe 60%. 55, 60%. We, we, we used to call them 100% non-rebreather masks. That's a complete lie. The most you can get is about 60%. If you want to get a higher FiO2 into somebody, you can take that Ambu bag with the face mask on it, put it on their face, and coordinate with their ventilations if they're spontaneously breathing. So you can go ahead and just as they breathe, you basically, because again, now that's a 100% reservoir or close. It's almost not quite 100%, but close to 100% where you can actually give them 100% FiO2-ish. If that doesn't work, what you're going to need to do then is to go into something that's a little more invasive, something like, not, or a little more interventional. Non-invasive ventilation, which is the sort of a closed system where you actually add some pressure to the system and can titrate oxygen. The high flow uh, nasal cannula thing, or the high flow oxygen delivery system that you heard a little bit about, we'll talk a smidge more about. And then we get into the big stuff. It's getting something down that airway somehow to get somebody oxygenated and ventilated. And we have that entire range. And what's cool about that is that if you're sophisticated in how you approach things, you're going to choose things on purpose. For example, say you have a COPD -er who's not that bad, but is working, but not terribly bad, not somebody that you're you know, freaking out about, but they're on the sort of mild to moderate range. That's, and you, you're worried about giving, and they're a little hypoxic. You don't want to give them too much oxygen. Well, that's the person you're going to, on pur purpose, for real, grab that Venturi mask, where you can set that and say, I want an FiO2 of 27%. And you can set that with the Venturi mask, and that way you titrate exactly how much oxygen they're getting. So you don't run the risk of driving down their hypoxic drive and having them not breathe very well. So you have lots of levels of sophistication when it comes to treating people with respiratory failure or an impending respiratory failure. So know your options, know the range of things, and know why you pick what you pick when you pick it. 
Now, when it comes to actually interventional things, when it comes to the airway, a couple of things you need to just familiarize yourself with. Everyone should get good at DL. So direct laryngoscopy is something everyone in this room should get good at because it is a backup for everything. There's a, there's a direct laryngoscope in every hospital in this country. So know that that is there, but it's not your be all end all. You always should have at least one backup that is extra glottic something like an LMA or something that's above the glottic opening, an LMA and eye gel, I'll show you some of those. And a, a, another intervention that's intraglottic, which is going through the airway. So you have something like a, a bougie, where I can actually go through those cords and get a tube down. Or I have a video scope where I can, can look down there and get the tube down. So you have something that's extraglottic to buy you time if you need to, something that's a backup to getting a tube actually down that airway, like a bougie or a laryngoscope, or a video scope, and you have your DL. So, and then always know that if you fail in your airway management, if you fail, there is a trachea behind skin and whatever else happens to be there in everyone. So if worse comes to worse, and if you really are strapped and you cannot get somebody oxygenated or ventilated, you can always go here. You can always go through the neck. Down in there somewhere is a trachea. So know that that is the be all and end all if you really, really need to, a surgical or percutaneous crike. The goals when we have somebody who's in impending respiratory failure are threefold. One is to correct hypoxemia. So we want, if they're hypoxic, we want to fix that. We also want to re reduce the load or stress on the patient. We want them to be able to ventilate off anything that is, is you know, sort of carbon dioxide-ish. So we want to reduce the stress on them, so help them breathe better. And we'd also like to basically optimize the strength of their pump, of their respiratory pump. And there are ways to do that as far as how we manage them. Now think about it. You heard about asthma. One of the things you do to help the respiratory pump in asthma is you dilate those airways because they're not working very well. The things that you, th that was, that's one of the sort of management issues that is actually helping the airway in addition to all the things that we think, we think about with oxygenation and ventilation as well. Non-invasive ventilation is magic. So let's say you have that hypoxic person and, you, and so we've learned that your goal is, a, is a, you know, a saturation of say 96%. We talked about that on the panel. That's your goal, but you can't get there. So, and you've tried nasal cannula and that doesn't work. And you've tried a non-rebreather and that doesn't work. You've even tried assisted ventilation and that doesn't work. What's your next step? Well, non-invasive ventilation is a game changer, and this has been around now for probably 20 years. It's been around for a lot longer, but we've had it in our practice in emergency medicine for about 20 years. Where this came up, actually, the background of this is interesting. In Europe, years and years ago, probably 40 year, 45 years ago now, there was an instance, it's all, like every, so emergency medicine is awesome. We MacGyver stuff, right? You're in the ER, you gotta do something, what are you gonna do? So the situation they were in was a guy who was dying of respiratory failure, dying of respiratory failure. I think it was pulmonary edema. And the person who was taking care of him looked at the ventilator and the patient said, no, don't want to be ventilated. Fine. So they looked at the ventilator and they looked at the Ambu bag mask on there and said, well, wait a minute. If I put that mask on that machine, put them together and just put it on the patient's face and then turn on peep, what would happen? What would happen with that? Brilliant idea. Kind of duct taped it to the guy's face and voila turned around like a rose. It was, like, it was fabulous. There were a few tweaks in the system. When they took the mask off, it had been on kind of long and too hard, so there's like this necrotic kind of diamond here. That's not good. Needed a little bit of, of design sort of management, but it turned out it was a great intervention. So it is an alternative to intubation in the, in the hypoventilating or hypooxygenating patient. You have to select them carefully, but it is fabulous. If you do it right, you are going to preventing the, prevent the need to intubate people by about 50%, and in some instances, as high as 90%, like congestive heart failure. So it really is magic. If your heart is set on doing a gajillion intubations, this is gonna steal them from you, but that's a good thing for the patient. We'll talk about which conditions to choose it for, but there's some you are on purpose going to grab non-invasive ventilation literally when they hit the door. You've already heard about one of them. We're gonna grab that on purpose to use, and know that there's certain cases where it is counterproductive. So if you get in there and you're working with this non-invasive ventilation and the patient's getting worse, take it off. Go back to what you know, which is to intubate. Or don't use it as a delay tactic for someone you know you are going to have to tube. Now, most of the time, though, that isn't. If you're careful choosing the right person, you're going to have the right people that you're sticking on non-invasive ventilation. This is a hugely important tool, very important tool in our lexicon. Now, it came from the idea, this is, this is an iron lung. Okay, this is in the era of polio. And the, what's happening to that person inside this iron lung isn't positive pressure ventilation. It's negative pressure ventilation. So that person is encased in this iron lung, this big cylinder, where, where basically air gets sucked out of the iron lung. And when it gets sucked out, the patient breathes in. 
and then air gets pushed into the iron lung, and when air gets pushed in, they breathe out by all the pressure going out. It doesn't, there's nothing happening in the airway itself. This is all in the body. The lungs are inside this thing, and pressure is pumped in and out, and that's how they breathe. They used to have rooms full of people with this. If you don't believe in vaccination, I'll tell you, th this is what the polio vaccine, vaccine got rid of. This was rampant. It was just terrifying back in the sort of 30s, 40s, and 50s. This was a terrible thing. This is negative pressure ventilation, though. Positive pressure ventilation actually takes it and puts it within the system itself, puts it actually into the lungs itself. So this is assisted ventilation that helps people breathe better by sort of, it was again introduced in the sort of 1980s, that MacGyver approach, it was introduced in the 80s. And there are a lot of systems available to you in this regard. A couple terms you need to know as well. Um, NPPV is non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. That's what that stands for. PEEP, you know, is positive end expiratory pressure. So that's something where at the end of expiration, there's still a little pressure in the system. CPAP is you pick a number and that pressure is the same throughout the entire ventilatory, ventilatory cycle. Bi-level PAP, B-I-PAP, that is actually something where when they breathe in or out, it will vary. The machine senses when you start to breathe in or breathe out and it will change the amount of pressure it delivers depending where you are in that respiratory cycle. EPAP is the expiratory positive pressure in that, and IPAP is the inspiratory positive pressure in that. These terms are all important to kind of get under your belt so you have some idea of what the machine is doing. And I'll tell you, it is not rocket science. This is not a scary thing. This is actually a really super easy thing to use as long as you understand certain principles. So again, CPAP is continuous, bi-level, bi BLPAP. BiPAP, by the way, is a um, trade name. It's actually a company name. BLPAP is more technically appropriate for bi-level PAP. And each of those can be used at different levels of pressure. So that's basically how these work. The other thing is, it's, so it's out here doing its pressure thing. It has to connect to the patient somehow. So there are all different versions of ways that can happen. There, in fact, in Europe, there's an entire helmet that you slip over somebody's head and kind of cinch it around their neck, and that's how it's delivered. It can be done with a nasal cushion, just up against the nose here, a nasal mask over the nose here, a face mask over the nose here. There's even a sort of a face helmet thing, a shield thing that gets put on the front of the face. The reality is it just has to be a closed system. It needs to be a system where the pressure is controlled and all enclosed. It's one of the reasons if you use just the nasal anything, just a nasal mask or a nasal cushion, if the patient's mouth is open, that system is no longer a closed system. That's why these people need to keep their mouths closed or there's sometimes a chin strap to help with those. I'll tell you, when it comes to these interfaces, if you look at literature that's out there, there's not one that's particularly better than another, which is great. So what that tells you is that you can work with the patient individually, or you and your RT can work with the patient individually to choose which one works best for them. We just had a case recently of an acute decompensated heart failure patient who freaked out at the face mask, just totally freaked out, totally freaked out. However, when we got her on the nasal mask, she was fine, absolutely fine. We got her to close her mouth. She, she basically held her own mouth closed, and she was much better that way. So knowing that they all work pretty much equally is, gives you some latitude on what you choose in any individual patient. The key to non-invasive ventilation, no matter what you're using it for, is to start early. If you wait too long, where the patient's basically tipped over, they have no respiratory reserve anymore, they're exhausted because their muscles just don't work anymore, they're too hypoxic, they're too hypercarbic, so they're too confused to actually cooperate to get this done. So what you want to do is intervene early. And in particular, sort of um, entities, which we'll talk about in a second, are the ones you should grab it early for on purpose. In, and as far as settings are concerned, don't memorize anything, okay? Just, well, let me memorize one thing. So in general, if you're going to be grabbing a, a non-invasive machine. What you want to do, most people will use bi-level, so that's fine, and the numbers you want to remember are either eight over three or 10 over five. And if you kind of can't remember, I'll tell you the person to ask. Ask the RT. It's not a sin to talk to an RT. They know, in fact, I've learned some of my best airway management sort of tricks from RTs along for over the years. They have some fantastic insight. And if you ever can't quite remember, they'll, they'll guide you. It's like, well, what do you think about eight over three or 10 over five? It's like, oh yeah, that rings a bell, that sounds good. And then the, the, what's read on this slide, I think, is a very useful concept to remember. If the patient is still hypoxic, despite your eight over three or 10 over five, whatever number you've chosen initially, the patient is still hypoxic, what you're gonna wanna do is increase both together, basically forcing more oxygen into the system. If the patient is still hypercarbic, if that's why you did it, it's a bad COPD, or what you're gonna wanna do is increase the upper number only. So you're gonna go from eight over three to 10 over three or 12 over five, you're gonna go, I take that upper number up. It gives them a more chance to ventilate off the CO2. 
Those are simple principles that are really important to improving your success in using non-invasive ventilation. The other thing that's an aside, the only exception to taking those numbers as they are, the initial settings, are what you heard about this morning from Jess. If somebody comes in with acute decompensated heart failure and they are flooded, they are left-sided heart failure, they are flooded, you're gonna start high on purpose. You're gonna, take, you're gonna pick numbers like 15 over 10, 18 over 13. You're gonna pick big numbers because as long as their blood pressure is fine, which it usually is high, right? It's usually high. You're gonna be able to, they'll be able to handle that pressure in the system and it's gonna shove that fluid back into the interstitium. Pretty, actually, it's pretty effective. So and watch them because they get better pretty quickly. But that's the only time you're really on purpose gonna choose higher numbers is acute decompensated heart failure. So the patients you're gonna consider flat out get go from the very beginning, getting this thing set up and ready to go. Is you, say you get a radio call and you know there's a bad COPD or coming in or an acute decompensated heart failure patient coming in, or an obesity hypoventilation patient coming in, a 600 pound person or 500 pound person. Get that machine in the ER and get it ready, because that's gonna be one of your primary interventions in those three groups. There are a few other groups where you may wanna consider it though. Um, one of the groups that I am highly fond of this in is the end of life care patient. So in California, and I have many of your states I'm sure as well, we have a pulse, a, a basically a pre-hospital sort of choices that people have that they decide as far as what they want for their health care. Do everything, do nothing, and then there's this in-between that says, give me some fluids, fine, give me some antibiotics, fine. Non-invasive ventilation is okay. That is incredibly cool. If this person who really wants to be a, they just don't put a tube down, I don't want a tube down, but today I'm having a pneumonia and I'm having a lot of trouble breathing. And I might be able to tide, sometimes you can actually not just tide them over today, but actually get them over whatever today's episode is without having to intubate. So consider it in that group. I, I highly recommend it in that group. Everything else on this list, the data is a little bit sketchy. It's not terrible. There's very little data that says it harms people. Um, there's a little subset where it might, but in general, it just hasn't been proven to be particularly helpful as a, as a rule in the, the other people on that list. When it comes to COPD, it is considered a first-line therapy to use non-invasive ventilation. First, I want to say it again, first-line therapy. So you have somebody with moderate to severe COPD exacerbation, you're going to get this thing out, and you're going to plug them in. And remember, you're going to pick like 8 over 3 or 10 over 5, and you're going to watch them and see how they do. But this is so incredibly successful in COPD patients, it is remarkable what it will do. It decreases mortality, like for real decreases mortality. It decreases ICU lengths of stay. It decreases the need to intubate these patients. It is magic. It is considered first line for, for moderate to severe COPD, so please grab it. Just grab it and set it up because it is truly honest to God life-saving to use this in COPD patients. The key to this is you don't need it in the super, in the mild one. They're a little wheezy, they're not so bad. That, that person doesn't need it. The person who is just basically already completely altered because they're retaining CO2 above the level you could even measure, that person may not fly with it either because they're just too far gone. So that's a person you may need to go ahead and intubate, although I'll tell you, I still try non-invasive while I'm setting up because sometimes it, buys, it, it turns them around. It's that, it, that sort of moderate to severe person that's the person you're going to grab it for. It is first-line therapy, absolutely. In fact, the, the gold recommendations out there now, which is a consortium through the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, basically says this is the thing to do. And here's basically your general settings. If you have that person who is hypercapnic, COPD or they're hypercapnic, and they stay hypercapnic while you have them on this, remember, you're going to increase the IPAP only. That's what you're going to increase. There are criteria out there. So if you pull that gold guideline, which is actually, it's a pretty decent guideline, but if you pull that gold guideline and you look into it and it says when to consider non-invasive ventilation, it has all these kinds of numbers, which implies, for instance, the bottom one, you need a blood gas. I will tell you, you do not need a blood gas to know when to use this. You don't. You can clinically tell when someone is moderately to severely ill with COPD. The answer to here is just do it. I think a lot of us feel better if there's a number that says this is why I'm intervening, but you guys are smart people, and you can look at someone who's working hard to breathe, know they have COPD, and know this is the thing to do. So please grab it. Don't wait for a blood gas to come back. Trust your judgment. You'll know when to use this. And they get better really quickly. It's actually remarkable. It's very, very helpful in these folks. In the obesity hypoventilation syndrome person, this is often home therapy, so it's something you should consider in the ED, especially if this is somebody who's going to be sleeping in your emergency department. We have a policy at our, in our emergency department now where anybody with a BMI over 41 who's in, who is in our psych emergency department, which is a locked door emergency department, who's in, if, if, it's t if they're either, it's nighttime because they're sleeping or they're sleeping during the day, if they need to sleep, they come to our side to sleep 
and they got put, put on non-invasive ventilation. Because these patients may actually stop breathing in the middle of the night, especially if they come to see you in the emergency department, they're feeling a little sick. This is somebody you may want on non-invasive ventilation overnight. You already heard about pulmonary edema, and I will tell you, this has changed the game with pulmonary edema. Non-invasive ventilation has totally changed the game. You can literally take, in fact, we've all seen the cases, right? You get the call from the field, and the paramedics are on the radio. It's like, this patient is diaphoretic, and they have crackles to the apices, and they're working really, really hard to breathe. And we have a pre-hospital protocol, many of you do too, where they start non-invasive ventilation in the field. They put them on non-invasive ventilation in the field, positive pressure, and then bring them in. And not infrequently, if the transport time is five or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, by the time they get to us, they're doing Sudoku puzzles. It's like, dude, I'm fine. It can turn them around really quickly. It is magical, absolutely magical. and prevents intubation in up to 90%. So back in the day, those of us who have been practicing long enough to be gray around the temples, these people all got intubated. The drugs that we used were not particularly aggressive doses of anything, and we used a lot of Lasix, which doesn't necessarily help. This, plus what you heard about earlier with nitro and high doses, boom, is magic. It's like magic. These patients will, in fact, they turn around so well that you often have trouble convincing your admitting whoever that they need to be watched closely because they look great by the time your admitting person gets downstairs because you've done your job and done it very well. Non-invasive ventilation, absolutely magical for pulmonary edema. Again, bilateral PAP is fine. CPAP is fine. The key is just to use it. Now, I mentioned this at end-of-life care, and please just add it to your armamentarium at end-of-life care. Um, if somebody doesn't want to be intubated, ask them about this. They may be absolutely fine with it, and sometimes, again, it will buy time, usually, so they can at least family members can come be at the bedside, and sometimes it gets them over that illness. So I recommend it highly in that particular group. The predictors of success are a cooperative patient who can protect their airway, who isn't too sick. Again, that Goldilocks thing. And you're going to then basically you need to watch and see how they do. Most patients, if it's, if it's CHF, they'll get better pretty quickly. If it's COPD, it may take an hour or two or three, but if they're still working really hard at the end of an hour or two, it's not doing its job. You may need to do something else. Or check your meds. Make sure you're using all the right meds to treat them, you know, as far as the medical management of what you're treating. Your goal, again, is to get their CO2 down if it's up, their O2 up if it's down, and to get their worker breathing down. That's kind of your goal. Now, when should you give up? Well, if none of that's working, you would consider, consider giving up, but no, don't. One of the things that Jess mentioned to you earlier is this high-flow nasal cannula oxygen therapy. Now, I want to mention one thing, and it's in red there now, and I want you to know, this is for hypoxemic respiratory failure only. This isn't the COPD or who's retaining. This isn't going to help that person. This is going to help the person who has bad pneumonia, that you're having a heck of a time getting oxygenated. You tried some non-invasive ventilation. It's not really working. You can consider this. And this was initially tested in children with bronchiolitis, the hypoxic bronchiolitis kids, and it seemed to do a good job. So it's now expanding its role. It's used often in extubated patients in the ICU to kind of tide them over while they kind of get their strength back. People are post-op that get extubated. This is an intervention to consider. Again, hypoxemia only. It's not for the hypercapnic. All right, so say it just isn't working. You've done everything, it isn't working. They're unstable, they're hypoxic, they're hypercarbic, they're really acidotic because they're just working so hard to breathe. It's just not working. I need to do something else. So when you've given up, now you have to choose what's next. This and that, we've already gone past all the things that don't be, isn't an, a, some sort of invasive intervention. We're gonna be doing something invasively now. We're gonna be managing their airway. We're gonna be putting a tube in there somehow or a superglottic device in there somehow. We need to take over now. They're not able to do it anymore themselves. We need to take over now. If you get to that point, before you decide to intubate somebody, you get to that point, what I want you to do is ask yourself four questions. Are they truly unable to oxygenate? Have I done my best in that regard? Are they truly not able to ventilate? Are they they're not, they're hypercarbic, they're not ventilating well. Have I done my best in that regard? Am I treating their underlying illness well? It, can they protect their airway or not? And if somebody gets to the point where they just are so out of it they can't protect their airway, the last thing you want is for a bad COPD or who's now hypercarbic to vomit and aspirate. So that's something that's okay. Protect airway, I need to intubate. And if I think they're going to get worse no matter what I do, so say it's um, an overdose patient that you don't have an antidote for, that you know the natural course of it is, because they overdosed on this, that they're going to go down before they get better, that's somebody you're going to go ahead and, or you say you have to transport somebody. You need to drive them two, two, you know, two hours to the next hospital for their, ne for their next level of care. That may be somebody that you want to intubate. So make sure you're, when you, because you're, what you're doing is you're taking away someone's ability to breathe. So you better do that with the gravity of this, the decision you're making very much in the forefront of your mind. So I always ask myself these four questions every time to make sure I've done the best I can do in those, in those particular situations. And then if that's the case, 
most of us will default to direct laryngoscopy. Now, this is not a course, this is not a lecture on how to do direct laryngoscopy, but I can tell you certain tricks that will help you. First and foremost, please, please pre-oxygenate. We're gonna talk about that again when we do the RSI talk a little later this afternoon. But please, if you ever think about intubating somebody, I want you to look immediately at that patient's face. And if there is an oxygen on that patient's face, get it on there. Okay, get that patient pre-oxygenated. Don't try to do it on room air. You, you need a preserve, so please pre-oxygenate them. Use good technique. Don't get sloppy. If you do a lot of intubations, you, there's some wiggle room in intubation. You can be kind of sloppy and still get it most of the time, but the problem is about one in 20, you're gonna struggle with, and about one in 100, you're not gonna be able to get no matter what you do. So you sure wanna give yourself a leg up on that by doing the best possible technique you can. You put, get the position appropriately, get the patient, again, pre oxygenated use your technique for DL appropriately. And a couple technique pointers, uh, having taught for 30 years in an emergency medicine program, over and over again, I see certain things happen. One of them is, especially as people get comfortable and kind of cocky about intubating, what they'll do is they'll take that laryngoscope, they'll put it in the right side of the patient's mouth and sweep kind of to the middle, but not always right in the middle, looking the whole time. So it's in, I look, 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 and the problem is that I can see some cords, except now my laryngoscope is pointed at the patient's right foot, and it's not in the middle of the patient's mouth. I strongly recommend that you do not look in the patient's mouth until you have that laryngoscope directly to midline. In fact, I aim at the tip of it, just a smidgen at the patient's left foot, and lift, and then look. That way you're gonna give yourself the most opening you possibly can. Because seeing it doesn't mean you're gonna get the tube down there, right? So you often will block your own vision if you don't have enough room by getting the tube down there. So please, 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 give your, don't look until you have the blade where you need that blade to go. Okay, again, consider put t pointing that at the left um, foot a little bit because it gives you a little bit more room. A Couple other pointers as well. Um, if you're having trouble seeing, remember the airway is anterior, right? If you're looking straight down, you're usually looking straight down the esophagus. The airway is a little bit of a look up. If you need to bring that airway to you, what you can do is what's called bimanual laryngoscopy. What you are doing is you're looking. Okay, I'm looking. I, I did what Diane said. I came to the middle. I lifted it up, pointed a little bit to the patient's foot. Still can't quite see. I kind of see maybe epiglottis. That's all I see. You're going to reach around with your other hand. You're going to grab the thyroid cartilage, and you're going to push until you see. You're going to wiggle it around until you see. What usually happens is you're pushing down and moving it to the right, but you're watching. So watch and get it to where it's a good position and then take somebody else and have them hold it right there. Better yet, have the somebody else's fingers here already. Say, here, medical student, come here a second. Put your fingers right there. Now, you reach around, put your fingers on top of theirs, manipulate it around till you see, and then say, hold it right there. Now you have the, the, the best view you can get by manipulating the, the trachea itself to get a better view. It's called bimanual laryngoscopy. The other thing not to forget is to position the patient appropriately. Now, this thing is called ramping. And we used to think of ramping only in the obese. So in the overweight patient, we would ramp them because when they lay them, your, your goal is to have the external auditory canal, that hole in your ear, horizontal with your sternal notch. So you're gonna move the head and the neck however you need to, to get that hole lined up with that notch. Now, if I'm an obese person, I lie down like that, my head's way up here because I've got all this you know, sort of extra tissue back here. So we ramp them. We put a bunch of stuff behind their shoulders, even a little bit more behind their head, and now I've got a great position. That's beautiful. Recent research says that everybody getting ramped to start improves your, your um, success rate to intubate on your first attempt. So consider doing it to everybody. And your goal is that, again, that horizontal line, external auditory canal, sternal notch. This doodad, this bougie, is magic. I highly recommend, if you are not facile with the bougie, get facile. It is $6. It is something any of you can learn how to use, and it is magical, when you're, especially when you're in trouble. If you can't see that airway really well, but what you see is epiglottis. First of all, don't freak out. If you see epiglottis, do you know where the airway is? Of course you do. It's attached. Of course you know where that airway is. If you see epiglottis, you know that the airway is just beyond, so just distal, and anterior to that. You know that on purpose. You know that, that's anatomy, that just is what it is. So if I can get something, if all I can see is epiglottis, or I just get a little bit of arytenoids, or just, if that's all I can see, if I can take something that I can, that's a little bit stiff, with a little bit of an angle at the tip, and I can feed that, or I can watch it go beyond the epiglottis and then slip up into that airway. And if it's kind of stiff, 
where if I kind of rub it up and down inside the airway, I'm going to feel the bumps of those tracheal rings. Bump, 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 Boom. Now it's like a Seldinger technique. That thing's in the airway already. All I need to do now is feed a tube over it down into the airway, and I have an airway. Bougies are magic, and please, if you don't have them, get them in your emergency department. They are cheap. You throw them away. They're like magic. The, the steps to using this thing, you're going to do your usual laryngoscopy. So you're going to put it in the middle. You're going to aim it a little to the foot. You're going to lift, and then you're going to look, right? You already know that. You're going to get the best you can see, and then you're going to take your bougie, and you're going to slide this tip of it. I'll show you a picture in a sec. Up beyond the epiglottis and up into the airway and you're gonna feel for bumps. Now I will tell you what muscle memory tells you to do right then and there. Muscle memory says, because I have something down in the airway, my next step should be to take my laryngoscope out. Don't do that. Keep your laryngoscope in, keep looking, and then say, oh, assistant, assistant, can you please feed my endotracheal tube over my bougie, or better yet, have it preloaded a little bit, so you can then just grab the endotracheal tube and watch it go in. The reason for that is if you take that, that out, so let me show you a pic. So here's what it's doing. It's slipping down beyond this thing. I think I can use this, actually. Let me see if this works. Da, 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 da. Oops, no. There we go. Okay. So this is going, there's the epiglottis. It's slipping past the epiglottis and down into the airway. Fabulous. Fabulous, fabulous. That's wonderful. What I'm going to do then, those clicks, they call them clicks. I don't think it's clicks. It's bumps. It feels like bumps. You're going to feel that happen. We're going to flip the picture around here. It's going down. Now, my, my laryngoscope is in there. If I take that laryngoscope out, what happens is the whole airway kind of drops down. And now when I try to feed my endotracheal tube down, sometimes it gets hung up and won't go. It's so frustrating. So keep your laryngoscope in there. Keep it down there. And basically what you're doing is feeding that tube down. It's going to follow that bougie down into the airway, and voila, you have it intubated. So always, always keep that laryngoscope in there until you're sure that tube has passed. So the assistant's going to pass it down to you. You feed it, go through. It's magic. It is magic. It is magic. And I'm going to show you a little trick at the end where the bougie is not just for this instance. You can use it in other situations as well. Now, let's say you just are struggling. You are struggling, struggling, struggling. You just cannot get the tube down. It's so frustrating. You just, I can kind of see it, but it won't go. And it won't. I've tried every trick I know. It won't go. If the patient is deoxygenating, so they're desaturating, or they're getting hypercarbic, or they're just not ventilating, just come out and use an extraglottic device. What these extraglottic devices do is they sit above the glottic opening. They don't go down into the trachea. They sit above the glottic opening, and by using pressure from a bag, you're shoving air down into the trachea itself. The tip of it sits kind of occluding the esophagus, kind of, but most of the opening is sitting in front of the glottic opening. I'll show you some pictures. There are lots of these on the market. And the key to this, so if you anticipate, you've got somebody coming in and it's like, oh, that looks like a tough airway. Well, I'm not sure I'm going to get this one. Have one of these out and on the side of the bed, right there. Just have it right there to remind you that if you're struggling and somebody's saying, sat's dropping, sat's dropping, sat's dropping, Take your laryngoscope out and put one of these things in, or bag them, but better yet, put one of these things in. This is a King LT. Okay, this is basically something that it basically, sho you're shoving the distal tip of this into the esophagus. The proximal big balloon is sitting above the airway in the hypopharynx, and you basically are blowing up those balloons and ventilating through the hole in the middle. We don't use those King LTs much anymore. We tend to use these laryngomask airways. This sits in front of the glottic opening as well. This thing sits basically right... So it's coming down through the airway here, and here's your mask itself sitting in front of the glottic opening over there, not in front of the, uh, the esophagus. And what you're doing when you ventilate is here's my air coming through. Whoops, it likes to go down that because it's sitting in front of the glottic opening. Boom, beautiful. This is an eye gel. No, ma There's nothing to blow up in this thing. This is a solid formed thing, a little bit squishy in the mask itself. It slides in, so there's nothing you have to actually blow up. There's no balloon on this one. So this slides down there. Again, I have no interest in any of these products. Just know that there are different ones out there for you to choose from. This is how the eye gel works. Again, no balloons, no blowing up anything, no syringes. What is nice about this, and, and by the way, what you do that, so I've got this down. I'm, no, once you get it down and it's seated, you're going to start using, you take your Ambu bag and you're in a bag. You're going to watch the sat come up. You're going to be ventilating that person. Everyone takes a big, deep breath. You figure out why you were having trouble with the intubation. You kind of troubleshoot it again, and then you can try again. Or better yet, if what you've done is insert one of these extraglottic devices that you could intubate through, once you get them oxygenated and ventilated, you can slide an endotracheal tube through the center of this thing. It's going to come out and go down the airway most of the time and you can pull out the, the extraglottic device. So there's lots, again, lots of options for you. Just know that you need to be deliberate in what you choose how to use. 
What's the sexy thing these days, and actually is probably changing how we intubate in general, is videoscope. So what a videoscope is, your DL, your DL blade with a, with a video right in the front of it. It's cool, you've married together a video and your, your, your DL blade, which is lovely. I'll tell you the problem with this. You get gorgeous pictures on your screen and you have a hell of a time getting your tube down there. Again, because it's looking right at the glottic opening, but you still have to get your tube out here, down there. So there's some tricks to this. There's lots of options for, for these. There's some you can carry in your pocket. There's all kinds of options for these things. Again, wide variety, whichever you have is totally up to you. But the, the mantra for this, and I highly recommend this, it is basically patient, screen, patient, screen. And if you do it this way, if you say this mantra every time, I guarantee your success rate will skyrocket if you're having trouble. What you're doing is you basically take your laryngoscope blade, you put it in the middle of the patient's mouth, and you basically get it adjusted to where you think it's in the middle. You don't really need to lift that much. You just kind of get it settled in the middle. Don't look at your screen. You're tempted. You've been playing video games. You're used to looking. Don't look at the screen. Look at the patient. Get it in the middle to where you think it's in the right place. Now you look at your screen, look away from the patient. On your screen, you should put the glottic opening in the top third right in the middle. So jimmy it around over here until it's in the top third right in the middle. Now look away from your screen. Take your endotracheal tube, usually with the rigid stylet, insert that into the corner of the patient's mouth or the top of the patient's mouth and get it to behind the tongue. Again, you're not looking there yet, don't look. Because now when you do look over, if you've done that right, the tip of that, that, the, that endotracheal tube is ready to go. It's just saying hello to the glottic opening. Do this patient screen, patient screen. It is awesome, and I highly, highly recommend it. Remind yourself, remind yourself. And getting the glottic opening into the top of that top third of the picture in the middle is really important. One last trick, and then I'm gonna wrap. That bougie I talked about earlier, say you're having trouble getting your endotracheal tube to go through. I see that glottic opening, it's beautiful. Get your bougie. Pass your bougie through instead. Sometimes that's easier to do, so put your bougie through. So I'm looking, I'm passing my bougie through, there it goes through the cords. Now I pass my tube over it, voila, I have a tube. Hopefully this is helpful for airway stuff. I have a bajillion tricks if you're interested. I'm gonna let whoever's up next, come on up. Who's up next? There we go, Jess. So any questions, let me know, write them down, do the Slido thing, and I'll be back.